This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Transit Action Alliance of Guelph's webinar series, Learn About Transit. Tonight, we'll be talking about multimodal, multimodal transportation integration, a framework for sustainable planning. The agenda tonight, we'll do a welcome, talk about who TAG is, a webinar introduction, a little bit about our speaker, and after the webinar, we will do a question and answer session. We ask that you make your Q&As through the chat, or you can email them to us at tagwealth at gmail.com. So who is the Transit Action Alliance of Guelph? Well, we're a nonprofit, community-based organization which promotes cooperatively to promote better public transportation. Our mission is to advocate for a public transit system that is frequent, accessible, and affordable for all. Our goals are to educate motivate, advocate, and activate the community on transit matters. And tonight we'll be educating the community, hopefully to motivate them into advocating, uh, activating them to advocate for better transit and, and multimodal transit in our community. Our memberships are available for uh, $10 for individuals, 25 for community groups, nonprofits, Five for seniors and students and corporations and unions for a dollar, uh, excuse me, a hundred dollars. And you can also uh, donate what you can as well at tagwealth.com slash join. You can find us online on Facebook at, at um, Transit Action Alliance of Guelph. Our website is tagguelph.com. We're also on Twitter at tagguelph. We also have a tw twice a month uh, newsletter called T uh, On The Move, and you can subscribe to it at tagguelph.substack.com. So we hope that you've learned a little bit more about who we are as a group. So tonight's Learn About Transit uh, webinar is about integrated transportation. And our speaker tonight is Dennis Fletcher. Dennis is an experienced transportation planner with more than 30 years experience in the transit industry. He specializes in community-based transit and transportation solutions that emphasize innovation, coordination, and mobility. Dennis has an extensive transit planning, operations, and project management experience for fixed route and specialized transit projects derived from a range of positions held in the transit and consulting sectors. He has a successful track record in communicating complex ideas and developing consensus around innovative solutions with transit agencies, including extensive public and stakeholder engagement components. Dennis is a member of the board of directors of the Canadian Urban Trans Transit Association, and he sits on his governance committee and is an active member of the Accessible Transit Committee. So without further ado, here's Dennis. Uh, yes. Sorry, I've just got to move a couple of boxes out of the way here. Yeah, so thanks uh, thanks again, Steve. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this session on multimodal transportation planning. I'll just note that if you, uh, if you want to Google some of these topics, it's important that you put transportation in there. If you just Google multimodal, uh, multimodal networks or multimodal planning, you get something about neural nets and eyesight and something else. So be sure to include the word transportation. So let's uh, let's look quickly at our topics for this session, including just what we mean when we say multimodal transportation integration uh, and why integration is a good idea, and then get into some of the details of multimodal planning. This includes examining what makes a good multimodal network and what makes a good interface uh, as well as what that means. Uh, throughout much of this presentation, we'll look at a range of opportunities and 
related design elements for, for multimodal integration. So I'll, I'll say now that some of this material draws on guidelines developed by the US-based National Association of City Transportation Officials, affectionately known as NACTO, um, which is really the go-to source for information on many of these topics. Uh, in some of the areas, we'll also make reference to uh, OTM Book 18 from the Ontario Transportation uh, Ministry of Transportation on cycling examples, as well as some homegrown examples. So, and my final slide uh, in the deck, which you'll be able to get from the video after the presentation, uh, has some of the key references and, and links, so you can spend as much time as you uh, as you like getting into the the details of the topic. And finally, we'll finish up with a word on complete streets and then a summary of the, the key points to, uh, to remember. So what do we mean when we say multimodal transportation integration? For me, there are two major elements that are critical to address in integration. First is the network and the second is the interface. By network, I mean the, the infrastructure and the service uh, that can accommodate multiple modes, and that includes uh, roadways, parking lots, uh, transit routes, transit modes, all manner of bike paths, sidewalks, uh, and, and trails as well. Uh, by interface, I mean dealing with points where the network elements come together, uh, either at points like intersections uh, or in corridors uh, where modes share or coexist in, in the facilities. These two elements, network and interface, is where we'll spend a, a fair bit of our uh, of our time. So, but first, so why do we want to integrate transportation modes? Well, the first is it's inevitable. We we can't keep transit or transportation modes completely separate from one another. So really, we're talking about an approach to planning and to infrastructure development that maximizes efficiency and effectiveness and in turn is beneficial to the environment and issues of equity. So in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, it's about doing what we're doing uh, with less and doing more for more people without proportionate increases in, infra in, infra sorry, in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This uh, chart shows the carrying capacity of a range of modal infrastructure. And it's apparent that a network that is focused solely on the private automobile will have a lot less people carrying capacity than one that has a mix of other modes. In fact, walking and cycling and public transit tend to be much higher and automobile travel much lower in communities that have better and more transportation options. So this means that there is, there is latent demand for these alternatives, and that demand is, is suppressed by missing or unsafe facilities or, and poor quality facilities and, and services. So providing alternative options increases effectiveness and efficiency, which in turn is good for the environment. The remaining elements, are equity and choice. So the previous slide made the point that if you give people more choices, people will choose a wider range of options based on their personal needs. There's also a lot of reasons that people cannot or should not or will not, don't want to drive, including uh, being too young, uh, community visitors, uh, the very elderly or people with disabilities, and, and some people choose not to drive out of consideration for the environment, uh, for cost priorities, because they'd rather spend their money on something else. Um, and mom and dad taxis. Um, mom and dad would much prefer that there are a wider range of transportation options that kids can take advantage of, whether that's walking or cycling or transit in, in some cases, rather than driving the kids to the mall. In an ideal scenario, it, it kind of comes down to this, that we would, we would choose our destination based on the nature and quality of the per, our personal experience at that destination, and not simply where our limited choices force us to go. 
So that's really what it comes down to is this issue of choice. And that includes choice for people who want to walk, people who want to bike, and people who want to drive their cars. I'm sure you've seen many examples of the transportation pyramid, which puts auto drivers at the top and active modes at the bottom, and the need to invert the pyramid to prioritize modes in the, in the reverse order. Um, in my experience in trying to explain this to, to, to people, the, the illustrations are somewhat problematic, partly because different sources are inconsistent, like these two, at what being at the top of the pyramid means. Is that good or bad? Um, these, these two drawings drawn from different sources both have the same order, uh, but the pyramid shape is different. Uh, and also because some people interpret the proportions in the pyramid in terms of the target volumes of trips, which is also part of what this difference is trying to, uh, trying to address. So I think it's useful to clarify both and also to counter the common perspective that multimodal integration is all part of the war on cars. So in terms of volumes of trips, the, the pyramid is a little counterintuitive since the top typically means better, uh, but the proportions at the top are typically, typically smaller. So let's convert the pyramid to a square and to understand volumes. And in many communities, especially smaller and medium-sized cities like Guelph, auto drivers dominate the trips. And when combined with auto passengers leave just a very small percentage of trips for transit bikes and pedestrians. With a multimodal approach, the goal is to shift the volumes of trips, reducing auto driver trips and expanding the proportion of all other trips, starting with walking and cycling. So I'm doing some work for uh, for a client on uh, Vancouver's North Shore, and I know we have somebody from Vancouver here, so it's in the it's in uh, West Vancouver. And uh, the goal there in in this project is to cap the the auto drivers for the, a very large residential development at 50% of all the trips in the peak period. So where our pyramid does fit is to illustrate the planning priority we have to give to non-auto modes to achieve this shift. So it's kind of like affirmative action where for some time until the benefits are fully realized and acknowledged, we need mechanisms in place that allow us to focus on planning for and accommodating non-auto modes. This isn't a war on cars because it's about choice. It's about giving people viable options to get there in the way that suits them best, even if that's by car. So that means that all the import the modes are important in the network because auto traffic still needs to be accommodated. In a, in a growth scenario, future auto volumes at a smaller percentage of the total could still be larger than today's auto volumes. So rather than thinking in terms of inverting the pyramid, I think it's always more useful to think of balancing the scale going from this to this. So let's turn now and look at what makes up the good elements of multimodal integration. First, the network. There are five key elements, completeness, density, directness, access, and quality. So the availability of the street network uh, for bicycling and walking and dedicated facilities is all part of the of, of the completeness of the, of the network. It's about what proportion of the roads are fit for purpose by PEDs and cyclists and what other facilities are available. Is, are there facilities in your community that allow cyclists and, and PEDs to use them? The next step is what's the density of those, uh, of those facilities? The denser the network, the easier it is to travel, to travel through and you get less backtracking uh, to, to reach your particular destination. Directness, straighter is better than less straight, all other things being equal, but the quality of a route can help to offset this, and we'll talk about that in just a sec. Uh, fourth is access. Does the network get you to where you want to go using your preferred mode? 
So does it get you to important destinations like jobs and training or shopping or the transit station rather than just to the playground at the park? And finally, is the fifth element is quality. And as I noted, quality is important. A high quality facility can help offset other negative factors and low, a low quality facility can do the opposite. So a really good example is a bike path uh, you know, through a green space uh, where it might be actually longer uh, than the direct road, uh, the, the direct road route to get from uh, from A to B. But the quality of that ride in terms of safety, in terms of using green space, uh, uninterrupted travel, all of those things that go into into the quality of the of the trip make it much more attractive to uh, to some people, even though it's uh, even though it may be a longer trip. So uh, this slide is it's not at a large community scale, but I, I, I think it's useful to illustrate some of the key network points. This image is from a community not too far from Guelph, uh, which shall remain nameless uh, unless pressured, uh, where I'm working on a, a multimodal mobility strategy uh, for them. It's a fairly large suburban uh, area on the fringe of, uh, of, of Toronto. So let's pick out a few of the, the key features. What you can see here is a, is a fairly major uh, arterial street, two lanes in each direction with some median uh, treatments. There's a backlotted residential area. There's some, there's a, looks like a, the, the, a portion here of a great network uh, of, of trails that go off into green spaces and penetrate the neighborhoods. There's sidewalks. Um, there is a transit stop right there, but let's look at some of the some of the features. So at A, the sidewalk and the multi-use path are parallel to each other, but not connected. So it, you could argue that these duplicate each other, uh, although the the multi-use path is is stone dust and not maintained in the winter, except at the at the intersections. So so that's a that's a factor. And a little later on. We'll look at some uh, conditions where this kind of duplication of, of facilities might be appropriate in high volume areas. Um, although if you zoom in a little bit, this doesn't appear to be a high volume pedestrian and cycling area. So at B, uh, we've got pedestrians have created an informal uh, connection from the sidewalk to the multi-use path, suggesting that maybe this should have been considered in the first place. At C, uh, the trail networks on either side address each other the, in, in both directions, actually, to the northwest and to the southeast. They go on for quite, uh, you know, several kilometers. Uh, so the, these are these are significant trail uh, trail connections and they meet here and you can see the other side of the path, uh, but you have no way to get there. And that's a really this is a local example of a really good regional problem. Uh, in in coordinating the, the networks uh, where sometimes we create our own barriers simply by creating this situation. Other times we have to deal with this situation where that barrier in between really is uh, not passable. It's a river uh, or it's a train uh, a train right of way or or something uh, something like that. But in this case, the facilities the the facilities address each other. But there's no way to to get from uh, conveniently anyway from from one to the other. At D, the paved portion of the trail connects to an auto only driveway, not to the sidewalk. And at E, there is a bus stop there, uh, and it's connected to the sidewalk, which is great. Uh, but it is not connected to the multi use trail. And the sidewalk only provides access to the upstream and the downstream destinations. So the 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 intersection to the southwest is about 250 meters away, and the intersection to the northeast is about 300 meters away. And there's nothing in between. Uh, and there are bus stops at those upstream and downstream locations. So who is this bus stop for? Uh, it's not for the neighborhood. Uh, because in an accessible standard anyway, uh, they have no way of getting there. If you're capable of crossing a 15 meter um, 
green space path or white in the in the winter, then you have access from the neighborhood to this stop. Uh, anything else, you do not. Sorry, that was the the bus stop. So it's we need to think of these kinds of factors uh, at a wider neighborhood and citywide scale. This is the small example, but these these kinds of of elements and these facilities and their relationships can be can be viewed from the the citywide scale as uh, as well. So let's now turn to interfaces and talk about what makes a good interface. So this is the points where all these facilities meet. Cars meet bikes, meet buses, meet peds. Safety is obviously uh, paramount uh, and, and it's a, it has to be a given uh, in any of your, your, uh, your facilities, certainly that you're, you're designing. Not all situations are safe, but one that you've planned has to be. They have to be accessible and, and by accessibility, I mean not just um, physical accessibility for say people with dis disabilities, but accessibility to the rest of, of the network. They have to connect to things. Location is related to that. The actual location of an interface point is important as we just saw uh, in, that, in that slide. And it needs to be convenient as well. And those connections need to be convenient or else people will create that, uh, uh, that informal path on their, uh, on their own. There are 13 intersections in this point uh, in this chart and a couple of them are actually missing. Um, and, and some of them are actually kind of duplicates of others because it's, it's hard to completely differentiate the, uh, the, the modes. So we'll take a look at some of these, some of them more briefly uh, than others, but in each case, we'll look at some of the design issues, some of the examples and some of the overall uh, benefits. So these following slides are, are drawn heavily, uh, as I mentioned, from the NACDO guides on urban bikeway design, on urban street design, on uh, transit street design, and the, um, the Ontario Traffic Manual uh, Book 18, uh, which deals with, uh, with cycling facilities. So first up, bikes and cars. So this means uh, shared lanes, bike lanes, buffered lanes, and separated lanes. The first, the lowest level example is the shared shared lane arrows, or uh, which we refer often refer to as sharrows, uh, which can be used to indicate to both cyclists and motorists a safe alignment of your your vehicle. So you don't always see this, uh, but sharrows can be used where the the arrow is put, as it is in this instance, closer to the curb to indicate to the, the cyclist and the motorist, uh, you know, where they should be on the roadway and, and it's safe for the motorist to pass the, uh, the cyclist. And in other locations where the lane is, is narrower, the, the, the sharrow is put in the center of the, of the roadway to indicate again to both users uh, that the best location for the, uh, for the cyclist is in the middle of the lane uh, because it's not appropriate for uh, for the car to try and uh, to try and pass, sharrows also remind uh, motorists of the 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 actual presence of of cyclists and their right to the roadway. Uh, they advertise the appropriate route to all users and they assist in wayfinding. Uh, they have also been shown to reduce the instance of sidewalk riding and wrong way cycling, uh, which is important. There's still a lot of cyclists that don't understand which way they should ride on a road. Um, and thinking like a pedestrian and riding on the uh, on the left. So Shero's help in, in that instance as well. But shared lanes are the minimum level of cycling integration and should not be considered as a substitute for, uh, for bike lanes or for other treatments. So next is bike lanes. Uh, this is the, uh, these two images, one is from, the actual application is from, uh, from Milton. Uh, just outside of, uh, of, of Toronto. Uh, and conventional bike lanes, which are, are shown here, uh, increase bicycle comfort on and confidence on busy streets. It's a really important factor for them. They create some separation, so meaning more safety uh, between cyclists and automobiles, and that contributes to the comfort factor. They increase predictability of movements for, for both parts. 
Um, so this is kind of the next step up and they're, they're really applied on streets where there's maybe more than a, a, an average annual daily traffic of three to 5,000. Um, and with posted speeds, you know, kind of in the, in the 40 K, the court, the 40 K range. Next is a buffered lane, which is just a step up from the, uh, from the bike lane, but where there's a, where there's a larger buffer, uh, rather than just a line between the, uh, the cycle, the, the cycle lane and the travel lane and possibly between the cycle lane and the and the sidewalk. Sometimes the buffer is, as in the the drawing, just a, a wider a wider space. Uh, and sometimes it's a um, you know there might be uh, uh, frangible bollards uh, bollards you can knock down uh, in the as as part of that space. When there's a parking lane there, the the space is important uh, because it allows the rider to ride closer. To the to the travel lane without getting too close to it and be able to avoid being doored uh, by by somebody in the uh, in in the parking lane. The buffered lanes um, are you know often used again. They're sort of the next step up in terms of traffic at higher traffic levels, um, but they can be applied anywhere a standard bike lane is considered uh, and where there's enough width. To accommodate the the additional uh, the additional facility, and the next facility is the is the the lane that is physically separated. Um, for our Vancouver friends, this is Vancouver. I think it's 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 on one of the bridge approaches. I forget I forget which one. Um, this this uh, this picture was actually part of a campaign to get a to do away with the uh, the 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 bike track, uh, noting that there were no bikes bikes in the uh, in the bicycle facility, while traffic trying to get onto the bridge is uh, is kind of jammed up. Um, and of course, it's it's almost as easy to find the reverse situation as well, where those lanes are empty and the bike uh, the bike is busy. Um, but that's all part of the uh, of, of the balance that's required in the uh, in in the planning. So. The, the cycle track is for for higher sorry for higher volume uh, uh, cycle facilities. Uh, the buffer often allows uh, occasionally there's, there's there can be incorporated parking along the line. The wider buffer again allows access for car passengers to open their door uh, and get out and then safely uh, uh, safely cross uh, cross over. Um, and then finally, with with bikes is is at intersections. Bikes can can benefit from intersection crossings, uh, bike boxes, and even cycling only signals. Uh, this is a signal at one of the trail exits from Edwards Gardens uh, in Toronto on uh, crossing uh, Lawrence Avenue. So. The next facility, the next interface to talk about is where cars and peds rub shoulders, figuratively, uh, and preferably bikes are absent but nearby, and that's the sidewalk. So there's two elements about sidewalks I want to talk about. One is zones and one is one is curbs. Sidewalks can have up to four functional zones, which may or may not always be present, but have to be considered as, as part of your multimodal planning. So first is the frontage zone. Um, that's the area that provides direct access to the buildings. It's often used for uh, small, can be used for small patios or the sandwich boards or the um, the the host or hostess in front of a uh, in front of a restaurant, the parking valet, any kind of those those sorts of uh, of, of, of services. Uh, then there's the main pedestrian through zone, and this is the this is the traffic carrying component of the uh, of the sidewalk so it needs to be it needs to be wide enough to accommodate the volumes uh, without um, without uh, conflicting with the other uh, two zones uh, and it needs it needs to be wide enough to be uh, to be accessible then there's the street furniture uh, zone typically up against the curb which is your street lights and your benches and your bike racks and your planters 
um, and all of uh, all of those kinds of uh, kinds of features. Then occasionally there is uh, what's referred to as the enhancement or a or a buffer zone, which might be a bike uh, a bike path, uh, but could accommodate um, curb extensions, uh, small parks, uh, stormwater management features, sometimes parking, bike racks, uh, a bike share station, uh, all kinds of things can be can be in in these that also help to separate the bikes from the cars uh, and provide uh, provide additional uh, additional functionality as uh, as well. When we're looking at curbs around around sidewalks, oh sorry, this is um, this is an example of a sidewalk. Again, my Vancouver example. This is Granville Mall, uh, which which has the wide sidewalks, and you can see the zones, uh, the same zones in here. There isn't an enhancement or or buffer zone. But the, the frontage zone is there, the pedestrian zone, although it does get to be a little congested uh, right in here, the street furniture zone, which is kind of encroaching, um, and then the, the, uh, the street itself um, is, uh, is, is primarily transit. For, for curb space on, on sidewalks, there's a whole lot of different curb treatments, and I'm not going to get into them uh, all. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the sources do. Uh, this is an example of a curb extension where curb extensions can increase the overall visibility of uh, four pedestrians by aligning them with the parking lane and it reduces um, the crossing distance for uh, four pedestrians. Uh, this kind of curb extension can be a, um, uh, used at a bus stop uh, as well well, and uh, the, lots of lots of different other interfaces with um, between cars and transit and the uh, and and the pedestrians. So next is the intersection of bikes and peds. So the multi-use trail. So this is one where cars and transit are absent, but bikes and peds have to coexist. So the basic design allows ample room for cyclists to pass pedestrians where use is low enough uh, to accommodate both modes, uh, plus inline skaters and skateboarders uh, in both directions. If volumes are higher, uh, the, the first response is to widen, uh, widen the path. Uh, and create a, a wider path if, if possible. This photo is from a section of the Martin Goodman Trail on the uh, part of the Waterfront Trail in, in Toronto, which uh, routinely sees uh, fairly heavy use. Um, this picture, I think, was designed not to show that. Um, but the basic design here is to accommodate um, uh, higher volumes through simply through more capacity and a, and a wider uh, a wider lane. When pedestrian volumes are very high, uh, it may be appropriate to separate the, uh, separate the facilities and provide a separate sidewalk as well as the, the, uh, the multi-use um, multi trail. And there's a lots of variations on these. Sometimes it's, uh, features are done like this just at, at small hills uh, and, and it's actually the reverse, you know, to, to separate them where, where people need more space to uh, climb a hill or to come down a hill and accommodate higher speed by the by the cyclists, so lots of uh, lots of different options on uh, on how these can be uh, be provided. So next is bikes and buses. So how do we get them together? Uh, this can include bikes on board, uh, bike racks, and bike parking facilities. Uh, which might include shelters or or bike rooms. The city of Toronto um, now provides bike lockers at selected locations. I've got my slides out of order here, sorry. Um, managed by the Green Pea uh, Parking Authority. Generally speaking, uh, bikes on board uh, bikes on board buses are not a good idea, and bike racks are a good alternative. And this has really become kind of the industry standard uh, to put uh, um, bike rack on the front of a the front of a bus that can accommodate at least uh, at least two uh, two bikes. And this this allows people to ride to the stop, uh, maybe in a first mile, last mile, 
uh, situation or where the uh, where the ride in one direction can be can be hostile. Um, there's a if any of you have ever been to Lethbridge, Alberta, uh, where the wind always blows, it's a it's a windy place. Um, and there's a significant residential community to the west uh, of the uh, of the downtown. The wind, of course, blows off the Rockies uh, from the uh, from the west. So so people uh, there are, there's a much higher percentage of of cyclists that ride from the residential area to downtown eastbound with the wind. Uh, and then in the evening when they're going home, they put their bikes on the racks and uh, and take the uh, take the bus home. Lots of applications uh, like that, uh, where you can go in in one direction, uh, as well as as um, parceling up your ride and doing uh, your trip and doing it in different uh, in different segments. Uh, many go stations uh, and other facilities have large sheltered parking areas at, at selected locations. Go also provides available information on their website as to where these are are, are located. So you you know that there's a facility available to you. You can ride ride to the train station, park your bike. Um, at bike parking at destinations is important too, um, and uh, a lot of universities have have uh, fairly significant facilities to accommodate uh, bike parking as uh, as well. And uh, and finally, in at both Union Station uh, and City Hall in Toronto, uh, large secure facilities are provided. And there's more and more uh, examples of these. This picture is actually at uh, City Hall in uh, in Toronto, the uh, the commuter bike uh, facility that's uh, that's provided. Finally, uh, in our interface uh, example, we've got um, the the intersection of buses and cars, and this leads us to the bus lane, a shared lane, an HOV lane, or a dedicated bus lane. Implementing these kinds of lanes needs to consider the overall performance of the network, uh, but also in terms of its effectiveness and efficiency and addressing its people carrying capacity uh, rather than its vehicle carrying capacity. High performance levels for, of service for autos are desirable from a driver's perspective, but also indicate a significant underuse of the infrastructure. If you've got your roadway operating at uh, you know, level of service A during the, uh, the peak hour, and it's not a residential street, um, then you know, you've probably got too much, uh, too much capacity uh, for uh, for what you need. Lower levels of service have significantly higher carrying capacities, which can be improved uh, even more by balancing the infrastructure with other modes. So sometimes that balance is achieved by temporal restrictions, like peak only bus lanes, or by lanes that share access for high priority modes, like a shared bus bike lane, uh, or the HOV lane. The next step up is the, the shared lane. Um, and these are some examples from, uh, from the NACTO guidelines. The top, the top example is, is an example of a, a primarily cycling oriented shared lane. You can see that there's, a, there's actually a dedicated cycle track uh, here uh, and, and combined with a, a, a bus stop as well. Uh, but there's the bike box at the, at the downstream end this uh the lower one is the is a street uh shared primarily between autos and and transit that includes a curb extension at the the stop uh so the terminate the 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 curb lane uh the curb area is used for parking it's used for uh you know some uh uh sidewalk infrastructure uh it's used for a bike station and then it's used for a curb extension for the for the bus uh, at the bus stop. This uh, this is an example of uh, a one way shared street uh, with bikes and peds and transit. Uh, I zoom in here a, a little bit on uh, on this. So this is a one way street. Um, there is typically a, a one way one way travel in the other direction, one block up. Um, and certainly, so if you're in a 
in an environment, you know, like Hamilton or something that's built on on one-way streets, you know, this is a this is a, a, a viable uh, a viable option. But it gives over a large portion of the street. It still accommodates cars, uh, but it builds out the sidewalk to meet uh, to meet the buses. It it still accommodates parking. It has a one-way through lane. It has parking. Um, it has a bike station uh, located there, but you can you can see in the diagram that people, cyclists and and pedestrians as well, are starting to share the travel portion of the roadway because traffic volumes are lower and traffic speeds are uh, are are less. The example here uh, of the of a kind of share of a shared one-way street. Um, or or possibly or, or it can be a two-way uh, two-way street as as well um, is is where traffic is limited uh, through uh, narrower narrower streets uh, this kind of weaving chicane pattern uh, that that slows uh, slows traffic down there are bollards uh, along permanent bollards to protect uh, the pedestrians there are wider uh, wider pedestrian spaces at appropriate locations. That accommodate, um, uh, you know, patio spaces. Uh, that they can be used for uh, um, emergency access or unloading uh, access in a, in a little curb extension uh, like that. You know, lots of different uses and and in the way uh, that they can be uh, they can be used. So um, th this is appropriate in a constrained environment. You know, not the 40 meter uh, not the 40 meter right of way. And not in a facility that where there's no other option to the uh, to the, the the traffic the auto traffic capacity that you're that's required in your uh, in your network. So we've looked at a lot of examples that have dealt with most of the mode interface issues. What's left? A um, couple of things. Oops. To remember. Uh, one is accessibility, and I've mentioned this now a couple of times, uh, about accessibility of the of facilities and locations to the network, as well as mobility accessible accessibility issues. Amenities are important uh, at the bus stop, benches, information, uh, um, garbage cans, wayfinding facilities, uh, on the sidewalk, uh, benches. You know, a city that's built for bench built with benches is built for people. Uh, and those kinds of facilities are are really important. Information at the bus stop is is important as uh, as well. I want to finish off with a just a little bit of a discussion on complete streets uh, because complete streets are are have, have really kind of emerged over the last several years as kind of the the integration framework uh, for uh, for all of these different kinds of uh, kinds of facilities. Um, this is an uh, this is a uh, an excerpt from a, a document produced by Complete Streets for Canada. Uh, if you live in Vancouver, you may you may recognize it as the intersection of Dunsmuir and Hornby in downtown Vancouver. If you know that Starbucks. Uh, interestingly, in this uh, in this example, when we talk about complete streets, neither Hornby nor Dunsmuir in this area carries transit. Um, it's they are cycling facilities and uh, and auto and and pedestrians. So the typical definition of complete streets are about streets that are safe for everyone. People, uh, people who walk, bike, take transit, drive, all ages, all abilities, and and the policies you know really balance uh, the planning uh, planning for those. It's all a good idea. Uh, but a number of municipalities have come across a problem with the idea of complete uh, because it suggests that every street has to accommodate every mode. Um, and it's important to recognize that your, your network has to have a comprehensive planning process that allows people to get wherever they, they want to go, but it is multimodal. So that may mean you know, that you park your bike uh, and and use transit, or you put your bike on the uh, the bus to use uh, your your bike at the the end of your 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 trip. Um, it's not necessarily everything for everybody, particularly in constrained environments. 
uh, so it, you know it the the term complete streets often raises a an unreasonable expectation uh, among people and scares auto drivers and so it's uh, it's not you know uh, necessarily the the best uh, approach um, and there are others uh, in in Montreal uh, they don't use the uh, a translation of of uh, complete streets they use rue conviviale uh, which translates as friendly streets and others have begun to use livable streets um, your a lot of applications in in europe refer to livable streets um, boston is is quite famous uh, for its and san francisco uh, for their livable uh, their livable street frameworks although they don't use the e when they uh, when they spell it and Hamilton is a is another one uh, that has kind of covered all the bases with their complete livable better streets uh, framework. Um, but despite the uh, kind of convoluted name, it actually is a a good framework that that really points out the importance of of context sensitivity. So it it provides this chart which looks at the different uh, the the different modes and facilities. Um, and the different settings that they're in and understanding that those different settings have different priorities. A rural road is not a pedestrian facility. It's not intended for on-street parking. Um, it doesn't necessarily have a lot of green infrastructure and it probably doesn't have uh, transit service. Whereas an, an urban avenue is absolutely focused on transit needs to protect rapid transit, needs to protect for transit, cycling, uh, the pedestrian realm, uh, but also uh, almost as important through movement, less but still important uh, on, street, uh, on street parking. So the, the point is that it's important, and, and this gets back to our complete streets, complete streets, livable streets, uh, better streets means different things on different streets. Um, and and understanding what the role of each street is, uh, and and the role that it has to play in the connectivity and the completion of your your network and the access to destinations is all really uh, really important. So, what's important? A broad planning perspective is absolutely critical. Uh, you have to be able to consider all modes. You, you have to um, consider different aspects of geography, uh, the demography, finances, economics, uh, geography in particular, barriers like train tracks and rivers and freeways, both create problems and limit the opportunities to, uh, to be able to solve them. You, you need to consider all of the needs in the community, including commuters that are commonly auto drivers, uh, but equally considering students, tourists, and good movements at a citywide and, and even regional scale. Next is imagination and creativity. So the examples I've shown here in the presentation have hopefully given you a lot of ideas about how to incorporate and share different facilities and infrastructure. With some minor differences between the NACTO guides and OTM Book 18, they all fit within our regulatory framework. And finally, comprehensive planning is, is critical. A comprehensive network assessment and consider, considering broad measures of success that address all modes. This, this notion of, of assessment and measurement and success factors is really, uh, is really important. And we need to consider the individual modal level of service for all modes, not just cars, and address people carrying capacity, not just vehicles. The role of a transportation network is not to move bikes or buses or cars, it's to move people. So plan for people. As promised, my last slide has these, uh, uh, has the, the links which you'll be able to get off of the uh, uh, the, the video. Uh, my only uh, item left is to say thank you very much. Um, and I hope I haven't gone on too long, but I'm uh, happy to take uh, take some questions. That's great. Thanks, Dennis. That's great.
<clears throat> Dennis, you showed a image of uh, street planning with the uh, bus lanes. And it's always been uh, confusing to me. Why, why do LRTs tend to get located in the middle medians of, of large arterial roads, whereas BRTs tend to be in the curb lanes? <laughs> Yeah, it's a good uh, it's it's a good point, um, and and some of it is some of it is that context sensitivity. Um, you know, it's it's interesting when we when we first did the preliminary concept design for the Hamilton LRT, uh, it was a uh, a side running facility on on King Street, uh, and the Waterloo LRT is like that in some locations. Um, uh, the Waterloo LRT ION is a is you know is a is a good case study to look at all of the different examples because it's got some center running it's got some dedicated um, dedicated sections a fair bit of dedicated sections um, and it's got some side running um, and you know on, and on on split uh, split blocks as uh, as as well so the the advantage of side running is the same as what's used for bus and BRT, and and BRT facilities can be center uh, center median as well. The Cleveland Health Line, you know, is a is a good example, um, you know, of a dedicated um, center median uh, facility with stations. Viva in uh, in York Region on Highway Seven uh, is uh, is is the same. So it it depends on whether you're talking about you know formal BRT infrastructure facilities like Viva or BRT like Zoom, um, you know, which is really kind of a, a BRT light in Brampton. So it operates in in more or less in mixed traffic in the curb lane uh, and it has priority facilities at intersections and at, and at stops. And it's really the balance kind of between uh, the curb access uh, that each provides. So running in the curb lane uh, is more convenient for passengers uh, it, it's more convenient for uh, pedestrians as they become passengers and passengers as they become pedestrians in terms of access to the street and all of the functions on the uh, on the street whereas a center line station is 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 less convenient um, and the the balance that's exactly again, why I don't understand them because to me they they're dangerous relative to the to the side running because you have to cross half a street to get to them and cross back and all of that. So I'm just trying to make sense of why they're there in the first place. Right. So the 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 trade-off the trade-off is in is in reliability, um, and that a, a center running a center running facility tends to, um, you know, it can eliminate a lot of intersections from the route. So if you if you picture the um, the ion uh, curb running. Um, situation where there's still a lot of intersections uh, along the side running sections that that intersect the route and people can move on to the tracks to turn right uh, and they can cross the tracks to turn out of the side street uh, into the uh, into the travel path uh, the, the the travel portion of the uh, of the roadway with a uh, with a center line facility you can you can minimize those numbers of uh, of crossings, and if you ever looked at the at the uh, design for uh, the centerline Hamilton LRT, you'll see that you know you could only cross it, uh, it with cars at a certain number of points. There were additional crossings. There were actually there were more pedestrian crossings than there were car crossings. But by limiting the the uh, the ability to cross or interfere. Uh, with the the tracks or the traveled portion of the bus by putting it in the middle, you you fairly significantly improve the speed and the reliability of the service. And it really is that trade-off between access to the curb and the speed and reliability that you're trying to balance. I guess I'm, I'm using uh, St. Clair in Toronto as my reference, and it's not a very good reference. But uh, th thanks for the answer. I appreciate it very much. And there are purists who would tell you that that St. Clair is not an LRT; it's a streetcar. Uh, I would tend to agree. <laughs> uh, 
we got a question from Mike about, uh, can you give an example of a one lane, one way street with bikes allowed to travel uh, counter flow? Uh, one lane, one way counter flow bikes. Um, not offhand, <laughs> no, um, but I know that the, um, the, the NACTO uh, manual, uh, if you go to um, Urban Street Design, it, uh, I'm, I'm sure it has it. Steve, could I ask a question a little broader on that? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just, uh, you know, Dennis, just uh, back to your, your great examples earlier of, you know, encouraging people to actually um, bike and walk more. You need, you need comfort, enjoyment, and, and directness. So the reason I ask that question is, unfortunately, Guelph is full of hills. And, for instance, if we come off our multi-use trail, the most direct route is actually, um, and the, most, uh, the, the least um, hilly, hilly route is actually a one-way street, unfortunately narrow um to get into the downtown so that's why i was kind of asking that question i it's i haven't got a good answer on it yet so i'm i'm hoping it, it is a possibility in the in the book at least in book 18 yeah i, I didn't necessarily need an example of it okay it, it it really comes down to the space you know if there's sufficient space to put in a bike lane um you know and say buffer it from the traffic it doesn't really matter which way the traffic is going and which way the bikes are going, um, you know, because they shouldn't they shouldn't be encountering one another. Um, you know, so there are examples of a two lane bike facility on this on one side of the street, um, and and that is you know that is essentially the same um, as the the counterflow uh, the counterflow situation. It's just missing the uh, the, the one-way traffic in the other direction. Um, so, you, you know, if it's if it's a it's it's really a case of uh, there, there's nothing wrong with the concept. It's it's really about whether in the in the particular context in the particular uh, situation there's enough space to accommodate the design. Thanks. I believe Shaw Street in Toronto would be a good example. Hmm. Okay. Yes. And and those kinds of things, you know, when you when you go back to the connectivity and the directness, those, you know, fill, finding a creative way to fill in those those missing links, uh, those little gaps in the in the network, um, you know, are are really, really important. Um, and, and as as you go through these materials and you're talking about the quality uh, of the of the network, uh, the the source the source points out that cyclists and pedestrians are much more sensitive to the quality of a facility than um, than auto drivers are, uh, and that applies in a lot of cases. Uh, cyclists and uh, pedestrians, in particular, particularly cyclists, are much more sensitive to a grade on a facility uh, than auto drivers are. Uh, you you know you can. You, you can you can take a, a, a poll a number of drivers who think a particular roadway is flat uh, and then ask the the cyclist if it's flat and get a totally different uh, different answer. Um, you know uh, a, a driver isn't even going to notice a three percent grade. Uh, a four percent grade is going to stop a number of cyclists and they're going to be walking up. Uh, over over a, a distance. So, but filling in those little gaps in the network in a in a creative way um, that can significantly reduce the the out of way travel for uh, for the pedestrian or for the um, or for the cyclist is is really uh, really important. Putting you know a small gap, uh, a gate in a fence, uh, you know for or in a in some sort of barrier for pedestrians can make a can make a dramatic uh, dramatic difference. Is there any other uh, questions? Uh, 
Um, Steve, it's Ted Bangay. I, um, I, want, I wonder if um, we could get an elaboration on why uh, bikes on board transit is a bad idea. I noticed in the photograph that there were maybe a half dozen to a dozen bikes on that one transit car, whereas a, a front-loading bus bike rack is going to have probably a maximum of three bikes. So. Uh, uh, the issue I'm picking up on is the volume of um, riders that could intersect with transit. Right. So, so my point was bikes, bikes on board buses is not a particularly, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think is a, is a particularly good idea. Uh, the examples that I gave were, um, were bike, showed a, a bike on board a train. Uh, this is actually the uh, Go Transit's uh, train car on the Niagara run that takes um, cyclists to uh, the Niagara Winery District to uh, to go on bike wine tours. Uh, but Go Transit trains uh, all have designated bike cars uh, where the seats at the back in this location back there uh, flip up and can be used, you know, for uh, for someone to. Uh, uh, to hold their uh, hold their bike, they are noted, you know, on the uh, on the exterior of the car, so passengers know uh, where the bike uh, the bike facilities uh, facilities are. So the and Via has a bike train, so the uh, a train provides you know a lot more space uh, and the ability you know to in some cases segregate them and provide dedicated space. Subway cars will often provide um, uh, bike spaces. Uh, SkyTrain in Vancouver provides uh, provides bike spaces. Um, you know, a, a lot of subway facilities provide a, a fairly significant space for for uh, for bikes on board. So so that's trains. When you come to buses, um, you know, th yes, it it is a trade off that most bike racks can some can carry three, most only carry two, uh, and that is sometimes a, a, a limiting factor. Uh, but there simply isn't the space uh, on board. To uh, to accommodate uh, accommodate bikes, and sometimes there is, um, and and there are there are systems and there are services that uh, leave it to the driver's discretion. And sometimes the driver, the operator, will use his or her discretion whether they're supposed to or or not. Um, in the transit business, that kind of uh, you know, allowing the operators to use their discretion is problematic, um, and and we try to avoid it all the time as much as as much as we can, because the issue is is if if Bob lets you bring hit the your bike on his bus, uh, but Gary doesn't, uh, then you've got that inconsistency in in performance, and it it drives a lot of complaints about well so-and-so let me bring it on or so-and-so stopped for me not at the stop location um so that kind of consistency when when you're operating to a schedule consistency and reliability is really important um and introducing that kind of flexibility uh is a problem for reliability thank you If someone could figure out how to put four or five bikes on a bus, though, uh, without making it longer, uh, you know, that would be uh, that would be fine. Um, Prince George, British Columbia, uh, for the longest time, had all of its bike racks sitting in boxes at the back of the garage uh, because they couldn't fit them on because their garage was so tight that their buses with a bike rack, if they put the bike racks on the buses, they wouldn't be able to get all the buses in the garage. So, um, but yeah, they, you know, the the two bikes on a two bikes on a rack, uh, just like two wheelchairs on a bus, uh, is sometimes a limiting factor. Uh, I'm gonna go, a question. Um, recently, we've been talking about uh, making our downtown car free, and uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about transit malls or, or something in that line so yeah I'm, I'm just i'm gonna skip down to the uh the shared the this one um you know which is which is just a, a small step from from car free 
uh, and the and the my former company that I just left uh, has just finished the um, uh, the Young Street environmental assessment that makes a portion of of Young Street uh, again car free. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when it was uh, car free in the uh, in the first place, um, and um, if you are uh, if you are alive in the 70s, you're old enough to remember that. It it really is, you know, about being able to maintain that that balance. So there has to be some level of access uh, for uh, emergency and loading. Um, loading, of course, might always also be in a laneway in the back, uh, you know, or somehow through the uh, through the back. Uh, when we were looking at very constrained um, operations for some portions in the old downtown uh, around Mary Street uh, for the LRT on King Street in uh, in Hamilton, um, you know, there was only going to be uh, one lane one way with, you know, so no stopping, no parking. Uh, and so the uh, emergency access would just uh, do what they had to do and stop the system uh, but loading access was where in some cases could be from the rear uh, and in other cases they were just going to have to work from the side street and hand bomb things uh, on carts down the uh, uh, down the road where uh, uh, you know a good portion of larger older cities still do so you know if you really want to make it car free um, you know, a, a particular particular facility, it can still accommodate transit. There's lots of examples of you know the the transit mall, um, and and some you know um, 16th Street in um, in Denver uh, is uh, is one that I uh, that I worked on. 16th Street is is one of downtown Denver's uh, high streets, and it connects the um, uh, the Colfax Transit Center, which is where all the buses come in at the one end with Union Station uh, at the other end, which is where all the where Amtrak and all the commuter trains come in. So it's an important corridor. It's a, it was important to maintain for transit. Um, and it um, and, and so it's it's used as a transit mall for both buses and uh, and and LRT. Um, it is it is primarily you know if you look at the at, at images of, of 16th Street the 16th Street Mall there's a lot of pedestrian activity there's a lot of pedestrian facilities um, but it, it's very clear that it's a transit it's it's also a transit facility um, you know depending on on your your levels of service and your levels of of transit activity mixing like in this instance that we, that we show here you know putting a bus down that street uh or or even in the at, as, as shown in the in the drawing uh putting putting lower frequency buses down there is is not an issue um so you know there there are there's a number of of amenities and service restrictions and and safety mechanisms uh that are put in place to make sure people don't uh don't step out into uh into traffic the speeds are low um so it it can't be you know it can't be used where you have to move you know a lot of buses and a lot of people uh, through a, a particular uh, a particular facility um, you know um, 20 30 40 buses an hour um, but if if the service if the the transit service is 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 very low frequency you know or periodic um, it, it's it's not unreasonable to look for a design that can can accommodate um pedestrians and bikes this kind of kind of emergency and or or loading access without allowing access to to general uh, general traffic uh or as in the photo uh still allowing some level of of general traffic access so there there really are and and it's the, you know the context is important the setting is important um i'm not really familiar enough with mcdonnell to to you know talk about it specifically um but i i think the whole point of this framework is 
to not just take an approach that says, you know, well, we're we're we want to close the street, uh, we want to provide, you know, we want to turn it into a, a pedestrian mall, um, and and that's the that's the answer. You know, do the assessment, look at the options. What can you accommodate? How are bikes, you know, accommodated in this facility, in in this area, in this block? How are uh, how is emergency access? Uh, provide emergency access is not really an issue as long as you can actually physically drive the vehicle down there. It doesn't matter what kind of a problem it creates. You just go and do it. Um, but loading is is another one. Can you know can loading be accommodated um, on a temporal basis uh, from the rear with facilities like in the uh, in the drawing? Uh, can low volumes of of cars be uh, be be accommodated? And can we make some trade offs? uh in in our original plan that can accommodate more modes uh in it and if you're you know you're tied to the idea of a pure pedestrian mall uh in 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 any location then you know that's that's fine um but it should be part of a comprehensive solution and understanding what the impacts are on the other current users of the facility and where they uh, how they are going to be accommodated in a way that you know that meets their needs whether that's auto drivers uh you know, or you know any other road users than pedestrians that you're uh, you're taking out of the uh, out of that portion of the network i'm not sure if I have question steve but Steve, yeah, can I ask? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, Dennis, I think, you know, the example you just showed there looks almost idyllic in a way. I'm, you know, compared to what downtown Guelph, um, or I should say the city, seems to be requiring if we're going to have mixing of vehicles and, and buses or cars, um, for instance, on the patio areas where they're going into parking spaces, they were putting up they were requir requiring these huge water fill tanks uh, as barriers. And there was even a suggestion of Jersey barriers at some point. And um, I'm just kind of wondering what you're showing a bus is actually, they, I'm assuming they would be driving through these pedestrianized areas. And I, and I cannot see Guelph, um, the liability thing, they just would just, I, I think they would just freak out at that sort of thing. Can you expand on that? Just to see what is actually really required and, um, in this situation sure um and well and like i say you know the 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 particular setting is important um you know the the people and the situation and the and and all of the stakeholders uh and and that's kind of a fundamental element of this this process is that you have to you know you you have to get input from everybody who's going to be affected either who are going to be using the facility or who are not uh who are going to not be allowed to uh, to to use the uh, the facility, there certainly is uh, a tendency in North America, you know, to overbuild and over safetyify uh, some you know some elements. Uh, the OTM books are pretty comprehensive in what you can and and can't do. Um, you know, the idea of Temporary patios, I think, is going to quickly be in the next edition of uh, of the OTM books uh, because you know everybody's looking at at street patios now, and you know the COVID experiments turned out to be a turned out to be a great idea, um, you know, and we we want to continue them, and that's that's certainly the the case in Toronto as as uh, as well, but you know I haven't I haven't seen. And and I I just mean that I haven't seen I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen a lot of good evidence that balances you know the benefits of a particular pilot or a quick response uh, COVID scenario totally justified in the in the situation, um, but where is the evidence that that creates as is a good long term solution? uh you know without if i i think we we need to take a step back and say 
this is what our objectives are. We want to create a pedestrian friendly environment. We want it to be safe. We want to still provide access for emergency and, and loading vehicles or, or not loading. Uh, you know, we want bikes involved. We don't want bikes, uh, bikes there because, but, and, and take into account all of those and understand how you're going to, to uh, accommodate them and, and what the, what the trade-offs are. So when we, we put the LRT, uh, up, uh, King street in, um, in, in Hamilton. And I say, when we put it there, of course, we never did put it there. Um, but when we, when we did the design, uh, there was, there was an impact on, on Dundurn, uh, North and South connecting King street and, and York in terms of traffic, because we were diverting a lot of traffic off of King street. And we came up with a comprehensive solution of how it was going to use King William and York. Uh, but because of where the highway 403, uh, interchange is, they all had to use Dundurn to get from York back down to King street, uh, to get to the 403 and the, and if you know that section of Dundurn, it's got some very old houses fairly close to the street. There's not a lot of right of way width. There was a bike lane on the street. So we had to look at that and, and make the trade off of saying, we're going to, we're going to put in an extra lane for cars. We're going to move the bike facility one block over. This is the trade off that we, that we made. Here's how we're going to continue to connect that bike network with the, uh, with the overall, overall network. And it was done in a very comprehensive way. The cyclists still weren't happy about it. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, you can't, you can't listen to one set of stakeholders uh, to the exclusion of, of, of others. And you have to, you, you still might make a decision that favors one over the other, uh, but it has to be done in a, in a context that includes input from, from everyone and comprehensively addresses, you know, what the needs of all the users are. Plan for people, not for vehicles. Was there any other uh, questions for Dennis? Dennis, this is Alex. Um, I'm just curious as to whether you've encountered a city like Guelph that seems to be, from what I can tell, going above and beyond what the, um, I've forgotten what the reference manual was that you mentioned, but above and beyond those requirements and becoming almost pathologically risk averse. And, and how would you, how would you propose addressing that in a way that that um, gets past that that extreme um, risk aversion it's um it's really tough and and you know when you talk about risk aversion you you know put your city name here um because it's 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 a very common uh common thing to be very uh, uh to be to be very risk averse i i think the issue um is it is you know having a better understanding of the real sources uh, of the risk, and and the the ability of the solution to to minimize uh, to minimize that risk, uh, and again that's you know comes from a from a detailed assessment, uh, and you know perhaps it's a pilot, um, you know perhaps it's a, a, a it's some sort of you know different experiment and drawing on the on the experience of others that you know volunteered to be the uh, volunteered to be the guinea pigs. Uh, you know we absolutely overbuild our uh, our facilities uh, in you know for our, our roadway facilities. I think you you know you may have seen the um, you may have seen a couple of different applications where um, um, graphic artists have taken the the uh, outlines of of um, at an intersection of the travel path of cars in the snow and redesigned the intersection around the portion of the intersection and the roadways that are actually used um, as opposed to what are built there. Um, there's several of them on online and uh, it's in in some cases quite dramatic 
you know, how much capacity we still have and how much safety we can still have with it with much lower levels uh, of infrastructure of infrastructure and intervention uh, in our network without without compromising, you know, any any of the uh, uh, any of the ideals, but it's a tough go because it's you know our our culture particularly we, you know when it comes to cars um and to to the drivers of cars and i guess maybe you know kind of humans in 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 general uh and and it becomes kind of a vicious cycle the the ministry of mto's approach to intersect highway intersection design is a, is a good example i mean as much as possible they have spent the last 30 years trying to standardize an intersection design and the the idea is is so that drivers you know encounter the same conditions every time they exit from an intersection uh or a, an interchange on the uh, on the highway so if you're driving along you know and you want to get off you just kind of peel off uh to the right and then you come to a signal uh, and then you turn left or then you turn right there you know as much wherever space permits they are identical and and the idea is that you know in order to be safe we have to make everything the same and we can't rely on people's you know good, good judgment and, and expertise um the, the flip side of that of course is the problem is that generally speaking people don't offer you know demonstrate good judgment and 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 their expertise but it is a it is a, a cycle, um, you know, where the more consistent and the more simple and the more uh, the 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 more overbuilt we make things, uh, the the more the users of those facilities tend to expect that, and the the less safe it becomes in situations where they you know where it's it's not present. You know, I'm a I'm a firm believer, though, in that the you know the 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 most unsafe uh, situation is one where the danger is not apparent. And there's a lot of instances where uh, you know situations danger is apparent, um, and people take care as a result of the understanding of that of that danger. They don't just go running out into the uh, into the street. We encounter this with transit terminal design all the time, uh, where, um, you know, Toronto and Metrolinx now will not build a transit facility that requires uh, people to cross the bus laneway. It just will not be done. They will go vertical, uh, you know, build tunnels underneath uh, the roadway or over top uh, the facility and build significant infrastructure in the middle of the roadway so that people cannot cross in front of a bus but they had to cross the street to get there okay they had to cross the street in front of uh in front of a bunch of cars maybe there was a signalized intersection maybe there wasn't uh, and they made that safely and at the transit intersection or in the transit center at the transit station they are now uh faced with the need to get across a, a laneway that is driven on by uh, highly trained professional drivers. And, and that's the situation where we separate them, not in the, in the, uh, the you know, the, the, the more dangerous crossing of the street to get there. I find it really, really frustrating that we, we spend so much money and so much infrastructure trying to dumb down our facilities um, and and make them uh, you know safe beyond any kind of reasonable um, reasonable situation and that's just my opinion I I know I, I didn't help you with that answer because basically all I said was I feel your pain and I also think that sometimes um, overbuilding is used as a deterrent to change. If you want to change something and you put in very high standards and things like water filled barriers or the barriers, you know, um, it's used by people who don't want transit to stop transit because it's going to cost a lot more. 
to cut to stop the changes. Mm -hmm. So well, there's Waterfield, always Waterfield barriers are an interesting uh, an interesting example and and you know I I I don't know anything about the the uh, the the details of the context on in in downtown Guelph, um, you know, but just from what you told me there, um, you know, Waterfield barriers are a speed uh, reduction. Um, uh, an, an energy reduction device. You know, they're not a barrier to keep people from uh, from banging into something on, you, you know, be, beyond it. They are about absorbing impact. Uh, they are not useful in a low speed environment. I mean, they are uh, in that they they will stop you from, they, they won't let you buy, um, you know, but in a low speed environment uh, like that, a you know some sort of whether it's a uh you know some sort of solid barrier uh is going to do the job just as well uh you know the waterfield barrier is designed to stop a vehicle you know traveling at 100 100 kilometers an hour um and i don't think that's happening in um you know in downtown downtown streets approaching a a, a patio but you know i mean having said that it's really hard to argue with people could the argument of people could die. Um, you know, transit transit sees this every time when they go up against uh, the fire department at budget time, where they uh, they uh, they provide all kinds of good rationale for why they need more money, um, and then the fire chief comes in and says, you know, if I don't get my new truck, people are going to die, and that's a hard argument to uh, it's a hard argument to counter. So I mean, people municipalities, uh, councillors, councils are very risk averse, not without uh, good reason. Um, but it really is about trying to find that that balance between, you know, what's 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 good, uh, what's good enough, which is not necessarily, you know, not, not necessarily what you want um, and what is too much. particularly if doing too much prevents you from doing other things. Uh, Dennis, what is legally required to turn a street into a slow street? Uh, legally in, I'm, I, I'm, I'm actually, I actually don't, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not actually uh, certain on, uh, on what the, uh, what the regulations, uh, what the regulations are or, or even in the in the new version of the book, whether there there is such a thing. All right. Is there any other questions for Dennis? All right. Uh, all right. Thanks, Dennis, very much for your time tonight and everybody for uh, attending. Uh, this webinar will be posted on our website uh, in the next day or two at tagguelph.com. Thanks for attending. Thanks for your attention, everybody. Thanks very much.